What's up, everyone? <sighs> Welcome. Welcome to a, another episode of BIM After Dark Live. My name is Jeff, also known as The Revit Kid. This is episode 64. I'm super excited to bring back on the show Brenton Weidberg. Uh, for those of you who missed last week's episode, uh, this is a part two. It uh, wasn't necessarily planned that way ahead of time, but uh, based on popular demand on you guys in the chat and some emails and some Twitter comments that I got, we decided to uh, rearrange the schedule and have Brenton come back on and continue uh, continue his chit chat about Revit family creation tips. And so for those of you who didn't see part two uh, or part one, uh, don't worry about it. Watch this and then you can go watch part one. You can watch them both uh, out of sync if you really want to. But basically, we're going to be talking about Revit family creation tips from Brenton Weiberg, who is a professional family creator. So he gets paid to create families. And so it's great to hear insights from someone who is actually getting paid to do the parametric Revit family creation thing. So uh, awesome. Super excited. I'll bring Brenton in in, in a few minutes. Um, but first, uh, I did want to say hi to you guys live on live here. Uh, remember, this is a... Um, uh, live show. So uh, I will be keeping track of the chat. If you have questions, um, if you just want to say, hey, we got some regulars in here, Tom and Steph and and, uh, and Oscar. How's it going, everyone? Um, one thing too, if you're watching this right now or in the future and you have not subscribed to my channel here on YouTube, do it now. I only have, I think, 615 more subscribers and we'll hit 50,000, which is pretty cool for a, uh, a, little, a little Revit blog. So, uh, so make sure you do that. And before we jump into the content, I did want to take a moment to thank our sponsor. So Polycam is our title sponsor this season of Bim After Dark Live. Um, for those of you that don't know what Polycam is or haven't seen the previous episode, it is an application for your iPhone or your iPad. I don't think they have an Android version. I don't know if they're working on one. But basically, it uses your LiDAR scanner as well as your photos uh, to create 3D models. Um, I will tell you that I've been testing it out quite a bit, and I'm going to be sharing more with you guys in the future. Um, but I actually went out to a job site today uh, to do an existing conditions uh, study. And uh, I only went with my phone and the tape measure. And all I did was tape one reference dimension and I'm trying to test how much I can get from all the scans I made using my phone. So super excited to share that with you guys. If you're interested, head on over to polycam.bimafterdark.com or hit the little QR code that's somewhere on my screen back here on your device. Uh, download it, install it now. You can try it out and use it for free. Um, if you do want to export in specific formats, you may need to pay for a professional license, which I believe is pretty cheap at $7 a month or something like that. Um, so thank you, Polycam, for sponsoring this show. I appreciate it, and I look forward to sharing with you guys uh, this technology. Super exciting. Okay, so let's do it now. Uh, Brenton, you're on live, man. How's it going? <laughs> Welcome back to the show. I appreciate you coming back on uh, and 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 pulling it audible and, and doing a two-parter, even though we didn't plan on that initially. <laughs> um, so maybe real quickly, we'll do an abridged version of your bio in case someone didn't see part one. So Brenton, who are you? What do you do? at revitfamily.biz is my website now. So if you want residential families, you can go there and see my work. <clears throat> uh, I apologize. I had you muted most of the time for everyone there. Oh. So. 
<laughs> so I guess if you guys want to see his bio now, you're going to have to go check out part one. But uh, real quickly, what, what, <laughs> what Brenton said is that he is an architect and uh, he started drafting uh, in Revit, et cetera, et cetera. You know, same thing he said last week. Um, and he does uh, produce and sell families at RevitFamily.biz. And he also runs his architecture firm, which I believe is, is it Weiss? Is it, tell me the name of your firm again. I'm sorry. Weiber, Weiber Consulting Weiber LLC. Consulting LLC. All right. It's real, real original. <laughs> so that's that's all, all good. All good. So, so, uh, so let's let's. Um, so last week, maybe we'll we'll quickly do a recap. We'll do the the big bad BIM tip of the week, and then we'll jump into uh, some new stuff. So, um, maybe um, um, I guess we can walk through real quickly, or just list them um, what what sort of tips we went through. Um, or maybe we don't have to list them exactly, but. Uh, we can sort of talk about a little bit, which was, I think, and I'm going to try and remember off the top of my head because I literally don't know what I did with the list that I wrote down, unless you have them. I've, I've got it. Okay. If you want. okay, if you want to go through it real quick, because I literally don't know what happened to that piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, so for the first part, we kind of talked about tips and tricks. Um, well, both mostly uh, best practices mm. is what we started with, kind of lessons learned from what, what I've learned from building professionally, uh, kind of getting a base foundation. So making sure you're picking the right um, template, Revit uh, family template to start off with, uh, making sure you're building a skeleton out of reference planes and that you're constraining the reference planes. Um, and then when you start to build geometry that you constrain geometry to reference planes and you don't constrain geometry to geometry. Um, uh, what else did we talk about? We kind of talked about um, nested families. Uh, we brought in some chairs to our table. <clears throat> then uh, we just started to dip our toes into making a repeating array. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we left off. Yeah. Yeah. Nested families. And we talked about um, using a, a family type um, parameter, which is pretty neat. That's always a great tip, oh, how, yeah. how to how to flip between types. So yeah, so that's awesome. And, and, and so, so it kind of without even us sort of planning that it kind of became sort of a uh, uh not not necessarily a beginner getting started but i think what what the whole theme of that was really um how important these best practices when you're starting the families and how 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 you start the foundations of your family is is key to successful use especially in the more complex versions i believe right, and yeah. i think that's i think that's what came across and i appreciate that and i hope uh Hope everyone else did too, and I'm sorry. Yes, I know everyone. He was muted. <laughs> I think some people are coming in. <laughs> it's there's like 30 chats that he's muted. I did that on purpose just to get 45 chats a minute because YouTube does <laughs> that. No, <laughs> yeah. it's a live show. I apologize, guys. <laughs> All right, so awesome. So so that's what we did in part one. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the big bad bim tip of the week, and then we will jump into part two, which is gonna be starting off kind of where we were, and then dipping our toes into the more advanced stuff, and maybe even talking about some of your cabinet families and how you approach those, but also how these how these principles applied to the creation of something like a cabinet family um, so with all that being said um, we're gonna jump into the uh, big bad bin tip of the week which is a new segment on the show here um, over the last five episodes of show um, and for those of you not familiar with this these are tips submitted by you so um, if you have a tip that you would like to see here on the show, uh, shoot me an email and tell me what your favorite Revit tip is, and I will possibly choose it and do it on the show. And if I choose your tip, guess what? I'll send you a free t-shirt just like this one here. Um, so uh, this week's tip, um, oops, I just realized, oh, hopefully you guys can still hear me, right? Yes, I think so. I thought I, I, thought I just... Uh, I thought I just uh, canceled that thing here. So hold on one second. I don't know what happened to all my, uh, all my lists here, man. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's Chris. I, I couldn't remember who it was from. So th this week's tip is, is from Chris, and it has to do with selection options. This is a great tip for anyone just learning Revit, but also some people who maybe didn't even realize that these buttons existed. So let's jump right into it now. So for this tip, we're gonna talk about the selection options on the bottom right-hand side of your Revit screen. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of them just to show you what they do if you've never seen them before. The first one is actually for selecting links. So right here, I have a link in this file, and if I click it, you can see I actually can select it, which is maybe what you wanna do. But let's say you have a project where you don't wanna select a link, you want it to be there for reference. If you just check this box, so it says X, now notice I cannot select a link. If I try, try anywhere, anywhere on this, I can't, I can't select a link. 
Next, Next we're going to talk, talk about pinned, pinned elements. elements. So, so there's, there's one down here that says pinned, pinned elements. elements. And right, right now, if I look at this laser scan, scan for example, I can, I can select, select it, I can move it around. around. If, if I select, select this laser scan and I pin it, it using PN on, on my keyboard, keyboard now I can't, I can't select, select it. This, this could, could be useful, useful for some, some of you if um, maybe you uh, don't, don't want to hover over a laser scan, for example, and always have it do that. Um, and, and so, so you pin it, it and then you make, make it so you can't, can't select the pin. The one, one thing I will tell you with this is this is, is always um, uh, an issue, issue for people, uh, especially, especially beginners, beginners, when they, they realize, realize they can't select something, something they, they don't, don't realize that it's pinned, pinned and then that, that, that checkbox check is there for can't, can't select pin elements. elements. The next, next one, one next to the left, left of pin is, is actually underlay. So if I jump over to this project here, this view has an underlay of the basement. So, so here's, here's the, the first floor, floor. I'm, I'm selecting, selecting the wall. And this, this is actually the foundation, foundation wall, see it grayed out? out. It's, it's an underlay. By, by default, this is turned off, and I can't, I can't select it. it. If, if I uncheck this little box here that says select underlay, underlay elements, elements, I can, I can now, now select, select my elements, elements that are underneath it. it. So the right, right of that is actually select by face. face. And, and what this allows you to do is, in certain situations, um, if, if you, you want to select, select an object, typically in Revit, Revit you, have you have to go to the edges to select, select them. If you, you want, want to select by face, face you uncheck that, that and it lets you select the object by face. face. Finally, the one all the way to the right is drag element on selection. So, so by, by default, and any new user to Revit can, can sympathize with this, if you, if you click, click, hold, and drag an object, you can move it. If you check that little box and say no, you can't do that anymore. Super useful. So check out those selection items on the bottom right hand side of your screen. All right. So thank you, Chris, for submitting that tip. I appreciate it. Um, also, I didn't mention, uh, even though it was in the graphic, that the tip of the week, the Big Bad Bam tip of the week, is actually sponsored by Enscape. Um, so if you don't know what Enscape is, definitely check out my channel. I've got a whole bunch of information on it, but it's a real-time rendering program for Revit, which is fantastic. And they have a new version coming out soon, 3.2, which has two really, really, really awesome new features, which I will be um, posting about here on the on the YouTube channel, so stick, stay tuned for that. If you're interested, head on over to enscape.bimafterdark.com and you'll get yourself a 10% discount off of a subscription to Enscape. So thank you, Enscape, for sponsoring uh, that segment and sending Chris a t-shirt. <laughs> All right, uh, and yes, I know, guys, there was echo. Uh, I apologize. Um, <laughs> everyone, a lot of people told me there was an echo. It's a live show. I apologize. Uh, basically, uh, there was two audio sources going out, and that's why I got all flustered in the beginning here. I guess uh, being the host and doing the producing is not always the greatest idea. <laughs> Maybe I should find someone to do the producing for me while I'm just doing the hosting stuff. <laughs> all right, Brenton. Let's do it, man. Awesome. <laughs> let's let's jump in. So, uh, so I think where we left off um, is this here table. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and everyone's seeing your screen, so I'll let you take it from here. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so up to this point, everything we learned last week, I use it in every single family. Uh, from here on out, we're going to get into more kind of specific um, elements and techniques, and I will try to show you other examples other than just this table as we go. So, um, <clears throat> so I think today, well, we left off. We had just put in to the param, oh, sorry, we got a save window here. We had just put in this parameter to control the number of chairs. Um, and I also jumped ahead a little bit and kind of showed you the trick on how to switch out chair styles. We'll mm -hmm. come back to that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing you do, one thing I wanted to mention that I forgot last week, when you add in um, a nested family, you always want to remember if to, um, I don't know what the industry term is for this. I call it I call it passing through parameters. Mm -hmm. But basically, you want to make the chair parameters available to the end user. So, mm -hmm. because it's a nested family, the end user can't control anything about that chair. Mm -hmm. So, in mm -hmm. order to make sure they can control it, you've got to click on the the, the family, and then oh, I've got my keynote manager up here. Um, you want to kick, click on the nested family and then you'll go into its type properties and you want to right now you can see you can control um, the material for the cushion and the the, the frame of the chair mm -hmm. and that's definitely we want at the very least we want the end user to be able to change the material of the mm -hmm. chairs to match 
because if they change the material of the table and then all of a sudden the chairs don't match, you're going to get, well, for me that does it professionally, I'm going to get a slew of emails. That, <laughs> and then I'm going to have right, right. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay. So you do this almost like any other parameter. You're going to open up the type parameters in the chair and you're just going to go over to where it says, you know, the material. And you're going to click this little box over here that says associate family parameter. You click that box and it'll bring up, you know, any existing uh, material parameters you have. Well, none of those really fit what we want. So we're just going to make a new one and we're just going to call it chair cushion. And for now, we'll leave it a type and that's all good. So we'll click OK. Now the nested family have its parameters can now are now brought to the end user in the project environment. So we're going to do that with the chair frame as well. We're going to create a new one, just call it chair. Um, Cause it's grouped under, I guess if you want to be thorough, <laughs> I should be more consistent. The other one, if we're going to be, yeah, I didn't do that on the other one. So I go back and forth, whether you should add material at the end of the parameter mm -hmm. name, just because it's already categorized under materials. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyways, okay. So now if we go over here to our parameters, you can see it's added mm -hmm. um, chair cushion and chair material. Awesome. Yeah, associating oh. associating family parameters. Yeah, that's that's huge. And one thing I will mention, because uh, somebody did comment on, on last week's video, um about when i think someone asked about add-ins or plugins and yes there are plugins and add-ins that do a lot of this stuff for you especially like associating family parameters and parameter management and stuff um, but i will say to someone learning how to do this and I, I would never show them the plugin version first i would make them do it manually <laughs> as, as a teacher of of the software and so i do want to sort of because because there might be a couple of people like oh yeah you, you get d roots or whatever it is you click a button and then it associates all the family parameters it does it automatically that's great but if you're teaching someone in my opinion um you should have them do it manually because then hopefully they understand the whole associate and pull through and you're passing yeah, through the parameters doing. yeah 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 uh, so i wanted to bring that up just because somebody did comment i think they they asked a question in the chat and then somebody did comment about sort of um you know why why would you not use plugins and i mean I'm, I'm not i'm not answering for you i guess in that sense but in my in my opinion when it comes to this kind of stuff um yeah the plugins are great and and i would definitely suggest if you're someone who understands what's happening to use them but i think if you're teaching someone how to use it you shouldn't say just click this plugin and associate it i don't think that would teach them the concept of what you're trying to show us right now for sure yeah i probably should look into more of the plugins <laughs> um but sometimes i get like so families are so fragile the more parameters they have the more paranoid you become mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you're like oh if i don't know exactly what something is doing i don't yeah. want it in my family <laughs> Fair enough. A, Fair break, enough. a break is catastrophic for me so yeah yeah <laughs> okay so <clears throat> that was a, a quick kind of finish up cleanly what we learned about last week so the next thing we're going to do is um, so it's cool that the user can go in and change the number of chairs, right? So we can put three in here, but wouldn't it be cooler if it would calculate the amount of chairs that could fit on the table based on the length? Because I know a lot of the times when I'm doing a layout, I'm trying to decide, okay, how many people, like if I'm doing a dining room, I want to see how big of a table can fit in there and I want to know how many it can seat. Mm -hmm. So it would be me bringing in the family and it can help me as a, with a, as a design tool. It's not just a table that sits in there. It's something I can change and try to alter my design based on, you know, this parametric table. So let's just look at a reference view and kind of dissect because in, in doing this next task, we're going to introduce, um, you know, functions and equations, mm -hmm. which, um, some people might be comfortable with other people might find this daunting. I know for a long time when I first started, I avoided, um, That's true. equations. If I could, I would mostly try to do anything by constraining it to the geometry. And then as a last resort, go to equations. But now having done this for a while, equations are your best friends. They, <laughs> they typically run how you think they will. And, but the geometry in Revit sometimes does and mm -hmm. doesn't. So. Um, so let's just break this down, like what kind of equation we're going to use. So our n, what we're trying to get is the number of chairs. So that's that's our variable, right, that we're solving for. Um, 
So if we just think about it, what we would do in order to figure out that number is we got to take, we got to find the space where the chairs go. So basically from this leg to this leg, and then essentially we divide that space by the width of the chair. And that'll tell us how many chairs will fit in there. Right? So concept conceptually, it's very, very simple. So we've got three variables, the one we're solving for, which is the chair count, the width of the chair, and then the, the space we're trying to fill with the chairs, three variables. So <clears throat> with that in mind, I'm just gonna create those three variables. Well, we've created one, we've already got the number of chairs. We're gonna create the other two variables and I'm gonna do this, try to maybe make it easy to follow. If I was making this family myself, I would not create the other two variables. I would put it all into one equation, but I, I think it'll be easier to learn this way. So. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna add a new parameter. We're just gonna call it chair width. And I have this personal standard that if the user isn't going to see this, which I don't want them to particularly use, I just do, I don't do spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and then I sort it into other, because for me, the other category is where I don't want people touching. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna click okay. So now we have a chair width parameter. And I probably should have pointed out that's a dimension. It's a, a length mm -hmm. parameter. Um, we're going to create another one called, I'm just going to call it space. We'll call it chair space. Again, a type parameter, it's a length parameter and we're going to sort it into other. Click okay. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do is now that we don't want the user to input anything into the chair, the number of chairs, I'm going to, I'm going to classify it down. I'm going to move it down into other. Okay. So for me, that's how I organize my families. <clears throat> so now I'm going to write the equation and we're going to break it a little bit, but um, okay. So the number of chairs, like we said, is simply the chair space. Oh, oops, I capitalized the P. Chair space divided by chair width. Okay, and if you've never done this before, um, when you're writing an equation, you can insert other variables just by simply writing them exactly how you named them. So casing and everything, spaces, cases, all has to be the same. All right, and we're gonna get an error because we have a zero. So I'm just gonna cut that real quick. Let's just take a guess at the I will chair. add. I will add because uh, there are a couple people asking questions about formulas, so I do think that this is a, a hot topic. Um, I will add that we didn't really, we didn't really um, take any sides on naming conventions, which is fine. But the one thing I will suggest is trying not to use any symbols that would s screw you yeah. up in formula creation when you're doing naming. Because naming, uh, formula creation, like you said, it's space and case sensitive, which is really important. But if you start doing underscores and dashes and all these things, it can get really confusing when you're trying to create formulas and you have to use subtraction, division, and all these different things. So yeah. I guess if, if you're not going to have a naming convention, definitely don't use wacky symbols that are going to screw up your formulas yeah. <laughs> or screw you to, up with your formulas. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would stick to alphanumeric stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And even, yeah, even numeric, I would say just alpha, right? Because if you start doing numeric, uh, it could be challenging too. But I that, guess. That, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, I agree with that. I have this horrible habit of sometimes using hyphens, mm. and then I'll go to try to put it in an equation, and it blows it up. Yeah, because it a hyphen is a is a minus. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to paste my equation back in now that I've entered values for those two um, variables, and now when I click out, it calculates it. Right, so it just took five feet divided by one foot five inches right and it came up with four so something to note here is the number of chairs that is an integer so it's always going to round to a whole the nearest whole number mm -hmm. and it's just going to mm -hmm. use standard rounding um you know if it's above five or 0.5 it goes up if it's below 0.5 it go it rounds down right so that's another thing um, we need to correct for right because for instance um, if you divided the chair space by the chair width and the value was 3.5, well, there's no such thing as a half a chair 
that doesn't make sense but it's going to round up to four chairs like it's doing right now it's rounding up to it could be rounding up to four chairs right and so graphically you're trying to shove in another chair where only half of a chair should fit so really what you want it to do is always round down so we're going to use the round down function in revit which is literally just round down and then you encapsulate it with brackets there and now it pushes it back down to three okay so now we've got our equation right now we just need to make sure our variables are correct so the chair width is a fixed variable that shouldn't change we can go well right now it's not it, mm -hmm. it doesn't change it could depending on what you did later <clears throat> but for now we'll go at, we're just going to go measure the chair width and then i'll come back um, but before we do that chair space let's also think about chair space that is a variable that will change uh, depending on how long the user you know, whatever the user puts in for the length of the table, that's going to change the available chair space. So we've got to come up with an equation that that calculates the chair space. So with that in mind, let's just take a look back at our table. So the first thing I'll do is I'm just going to quickly dimension these chairs just to see what the width is. All right, so it's one foot four. So my guess at one foot five is probably Pretty okay. I'm probably just going to leave it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then let's look at the table. So the space, <clears throat> the user puts in the length. So we definitely need to take out this whole area where the chair is, mm -hmm. the end chairs are. We're going to take that out. So that's convenient because we have this leg inset value. So we can take the length and subtract the leg inset value twice. And then that leaves us the gap in between these reference planes. So the only thing we have left to take care of to get out of there is basically the half width of the leg, which is two inches. So two inches on both sides, which is four inches. So hopefully everyone's following along. So let's try to put that into an equation. So we start with the length of the table. Then we're going to subtract. Did I, I missed an N length. And then we're going to subtract two times the, what did we call it? Leg in, uh, leg inset. And then on top of that, we have to subtract another four inches for the half widths of the legs on each side. Okay, so that gives us a chair space of four feet, eight inches, and then that gets fed up into our chair count calculation. And then we're gonna keep it at 1.5 because we determined that was probably a good guess. So now is this table, you know, sorry. sorry I, I was just gonna say, so so we should probably just unpack that real quick in case okay. in case anyone didn't follow along um, or 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 was or is gonna rewind it thirty times. Um, <laughs> but no, and I think you explained it well. But I just want to reiterate it just one more time before we move on from it. So basically, uh, you know, all that math there, uh, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what you're doing is you're because we don't the the chairs can't go beyond that leg in this particular family. Um, so what we're doing there is you're using math to basically define the space that you actually want the array to be in um, instead of because it can't just be the whole width right it has to be the width minus all of this stuff so i just wanted i just wanted everyone to sort of see that uh and hopefully they do and, and if they didn't i hope they just reiterate it one more time <laughs> and i will i I'm, i actually have a question because i know i've gotten this question before i would actually i would do it the same way you're doing it that's how i've always done it is is using um you know using the math and, and working your way down to this point but have you ever messed with reporting parameters in a condition like this? And do you have mm -hmm. a thought or opinion on them? <laughs> I don't think I have a strong opinion. I, when I was setting up for today, I was mm -hmm. thinking you could also do this with um, a reporting parameter. I think I've been, a reporting parameter is something that's kind of newer in mm -hmm. the, the environment. So I was always used to doing it this way. Right. Plus I'm using 2017. Mm -hmm. which I don't even know if it does or does not. In the have. family environment, I actually don't even know if, if you have the yeah. option. But I think, 
I think it might, but yeah. yeah. So I don't just probably cause force of habit, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. could, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, and that's, 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 that's why I was asking. Cause I've gotten the question a couple of times when I've done them too. And I still, for, for whatever reason, do it this way, probably because like you said, we're used to doing it this way, but I'm, you know, I was curious if you had an opinion on, on using them <laughs> before someone else yeah. does. Uh, someone did comment and said they're having trouble seeing the equation. I, I, oh. I you can, you can zoom in, but I was afraid to ask you to, because once you zoom in, it's just gonna, it's just gonna ruin your Revit dialogue this entire session. <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh but if, it's up to you if you want to try go for it uh, it's uh which in those of you that don't know you can use control and scroll to zoom into um to zoom into to this, these areas but now this whole thing that you're doing right now you're going to be doing it at the entire time because that's just what it is <laughs> the, ne <laughs> the next time you open the family types dialogue you're going to be readjusting it again it's just it's obnoxious okay. but hopefully now everyone okay. can see it uh, and read everything you type there. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to keep that in mind though, because mm -hmm. um, so you can see it is it is nice to see the equations. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, okay sorry. so <laughs> yeah, no, that was a good. I like the recap because you forget when you. This is so like second nature to me. So like you I forget. get it. It's it's it's, it's yeah exactly. You gotta and, and reiterating it's very very helpful. So I hope everyone follows along with that and again i'm checking out the chat so i see what you guys are saying so if there's okay, any good. questions I'll, I'll flag but let's keep going um okay so now basically if we go up here and we make it a 10 foot table and i click out of here you can see it added a chair to to the to the array and if we went insane and did like a 25 foot table it's going to put 15 chairs on there so let's take it back down to 10. So now the user does not have to think about the chair count, um, which may or may, may be good, may not be good. I've run into it where, you know, maybe the person just wants a longer table, but doesn't want it to add chairs. Maybe he just wants more room around his chairs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there's things you can do. You can add parameters to this to no end. You could add a cushion around each chair, like how much clearance do you want on each side? That could be user controlled, or you could just put it into the equation. But mm -hmm. this gets us you know, the general idea. Um, and the other thing I was mentioning earlier that maybe makes more sense now that you can see the equation is I would not have bothered to create these two extra parameters. And maybe this is another reason why I don't make a reporting parameter mm -hmm. is because I like as few parameters as possible. So I would, I would have just put these values into this equation. So I would have just put under chair width, it would have just been one foot five for me or, mm. And then I would have taken this whole equation, put it in brackets and stuck it where it says chair space right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have just had one big, huge equation instead of doing all this other stuff. And I guess, uh, that's hard to follow. It, yeah, no, no. And yeah, it's definitely hard to follow. And, um, I will say, I guess it depends. It depends on the, if, if that's the end goal of the family, right? Is if you're hard coding this in, then the only way to modify it would be to go into edit family, which again, if that's your intent, then that makes sense, right? Because then, then you're not you're not giving yeah. anyone the ability to go into it and, and control it. So that's a good point, though. It's and, and what you're doing is like you said, you're 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 eliminating two extra parameters that maybe, you know, um, the more parameters you have, the slower the family will get over time if it gets very complex, right? Yeah, um, the, the uh, an instance where I would do this is if that parameter fed into other calculations, then it's probably mm -hmm. worth it to, to pull it out. But Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we're just going to click OK. You'll see it updated the table. And we feel like champions because we're so <laughs> cool. I mean, we got it to work. Yeah, we got a table um, that automatically puts chairs in. <laughs> yeah. So as an example of, what I, of when I've used this is I use this technique on drawers. So my drawer cabinets, they all do this. So when you stretch the cabinet height, it, it adds more drawers. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, uh, let's just look, it's going to pop through the top of the cabinet, but why not? Um, so on my cabinets, the height, let's just, let's go insane and go four feet high, click okay. And it's going to pop up above the cabinet. This is my heaviest family. So excuse me, you click it's taking family. a couple <laughs> seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> There's, because a, there's, it is a, like, there's a discussion going on, by the way, about reporting parameters, which is interesting. <laughs> oh, really? 
So it looks like 2017 is when they were um, oh, there, when they were introduced. But but there are limitations to how they are used in formulas, according to Matt Cowley. So thanks, Matt. <laughs> we'll take yeah. your word for it. <laughs> um, awesome. Work. Okay, so on my on my particular cabinets, it not only takes into account the user's height, but um, this was a an example where I thought the user does want to enter the amount of drawers, right? Mm -hmm don't want to leave that up to some calculations. So it also takes into account the amount of drawers. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll adjust. And then you can, in my families, you can adjust the top drawer height separately because typically you want all your top drawers a certain height. Right. So right. it just divides up the remaining space for those bottom drawers, <laughs> which gets tricky. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because Lu Lewis asks, are, are, the wind, are the drawers operable? <laughs> <laughs> I... That seems crazy to me when I first started, but I have had requests like that. So. I, and I don't mean to laugh. It's just it's it's just one of those things that, of course, <laughs> someone would want them to open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you have had a request for that for opening. Yeah, I. Oh. Yeah, especially with doors. Like I've never understood. Mm. <laughs> That's pretty common lately. I'm getting people asking me that my doors need to open, and I guess it's for their walk, their fly throughs. But wait, wait, know. your cabinet doors or your regular doors? Both well, oh. regular doors, but oh, also I've gotten two requests for my cabinet doors to open, and I have no idea why. Interesting. But Interesting. but I'm telling you, like everyone uses these. Like I did it for an architect, but then mm -hmm. I'm getting all these other use cases. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Super interesting. <laughs> I I try to accommodate as many requests as I can reasonably right. that mm -hmm. I think you know other people could use. But okay. <laughs> Anyways, these drawers get a little more complicated because what I'm not showing you is like. Um, like I can go down to, if I just want one drawer hmm. or yeah, let's, and first let's do two, um, which is really, it ends up being just one drawer in the array, right? Cause the bottom of the bottom drawers are the only arrayed drawer. Mm -hmm. Uh, the top is just an instance of the drawer. So, um, oh man, I'm trying to decide how to explain this. It gets complicated and I'm going to show you on the table, um, because what, what happens is in an inst, in, a, in an array, they work great as long as you have two or more. Mm -hmm. But if you mm -hmm. shrunk down the table to the point where only one chair would fit, what are you gonna do? So that kind of brings me to our next portion of the family making <clears throat> is, and for me, um, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong version. For me, who has to write these families for everyone at all skill levels, I can't allow a family to break. If you were doing this in-house, you could easily say like, well, then don't put in anything less than two, right? But I don't <laughs> or, have- Or, I or don't... when it breaks, you know, you call, call the guy because you know he made it and, and you know what's going on type of thing, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't have that luxury. I have to make it as unbreakable as humanly possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the next concept I'm gonna introduce is the idea of checking user inputs. So. So far, we just pass whatever the user puts in the variable. We've just been blindly passing it into the geometry in the family. And we're basically letting the user control the family without any checks. Mm -hmm. So in the next step is using equations to check what the user inputs before it passes it into the family, right? So I do this all the time, pretty regularly in probably every family I've ever made. And it involves just um, basically making one more parameter for every parameter that the user is controlling. And some parameters don't need to be controlled, mm -hmm. but others do. So in this case, we're talking about the length of the table. So let me just, <clears throat> we've got a couple problems. One, the first problem is what is going to happen when the table shrinks and the equation that we used for um, chair count goes below two. What is that going to do to the array? So let's just, I mean, let's just break it for fun. So let's put a four foot table length and you can see it's calculated chairs to zero, right? So there definitely can't be zero in the array. Um, let's just try five feet and see if we can, yeah, okay, so one. So now it's got, it's calculated one chair, so awesome. It's doing what we asked it to do, but now we get an error because that's not a valid input for an array. 
Okay, so what we have to do is we have to put some conditions around this number of chairs, right? It, can, it can't go below two. So we've got to write an equation for what happens if the user puts in something that causes it to go below two. So this is where we introduce if statements. And this is probably, I don't find them that complicated, but this mm -hmm. is a lot to wrap your head around especially if you start nesting them in each other. Mm -hmm. But if you've used Excel, you know the format goes if, and you state the test, like what's the condition you're testing for, comma, um, if, it's tr if that condition is true, this is what we want the value to be. And then another comma, and if it's not true, this is what it should be. Did I say that right? If then that else this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sorry. That's how, when I write the equation, I'm literally in my head. If then else is what I'm saying. So, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's just begin our if statement. We'll just jump into it. I'm trying to think of a simple way to illustrate it, but we just got to, we just got to do it guys. So we're going to do if, and then what we're testing for is this whole equation that we just put in the original equation that has to be greater than or equal to two so let's start simple because revit does not have a greater than or equal to function it only has a greater a greater than function so um, we're just going to do greater than two Okay, so this is our condition. This is our test. If this whole equation is greater than two, actually, we could also flip this. How, let me do this. Let, let's let the test be if it's less than two, right? So if this whole equation is less than two, then we're gonna have a certain value. And okay, so let's think about this less than two, it can't be less than two. So if it is less than two, we don't care. We're still gonna have it be a value of two. So I'm gonna put two here, right? So this is what happens if the test is true. And in this case, less than two, okay? Then we put, a, put another um, comma. And this is what happens if the test isn't true. So anytime it's two or above, this is what we want to happen. And all we want it to do is that formula. We just want it to um, do the original formula. So I'm just gonna copy that formula from the test into here. <laughs> and then, sorry, I forgot to close the bracket. Then we close the bracket. And then I get an error. So let's figure out where I went. Oh, I do. I need one more. I need, you might need another one on the left too. Maybe not. No, no, no. I think you're good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Dude, I like the new Excel gives you colored brackets I to know. help you keep track. It makes, and power, power BI is the same way. It makes it so easy to see where you are, it like highlights and yeah. colors and everything. <laughs> okay. So now you can see instead of one, like it was before, it's got two in there because it recognized that the calculation was coming out under two. So if we go even further, when we put four as the table length before, it, it dropped it to zero. So let's just see what it does this time. It, it keeps it at two, right? So now the test would be if we go back up to an eight foot table that we know had three chairs, you see now it goes up, it'll bump up to three. And if we go back to that insane 25 foot table, it still puts in 15. So it's doing a check so that we never allow a value that isn't acceptable to enter into that array. Okay, so now we just made the array unbreakable, fingers crossed. Do people, does it seem like people are following in the chat? I know that was a lot to just digest. I think Hopefully so. Hopefully it makes sense. I think so. Let's see if, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And we have, so, so we, um, and I know some people asked too, um, last week we talked about the family cheat sheet you have. I do have a family cheat sheet as well. Um, 
and I will post links to both of them. My link is apparently broken. Uh, <laughs> before the show, Brenton told me, and I actually checked before we went live, and it looks like uh, a lot of those, uh, the site I use, uh, Legacy, they like archived a bunch of old stuff, and I didn't know what happened. So I will, I will set all that up. And there's two cheat sheets that you guys, that you guys will have access to that that help explain a lot of these formulas, and and I think especially combined, I think there's a lot of awesome information between them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we fixed that problem. So let's just see um, graphically what's going to happen though. So if we put this back down to like a five foot table, we know there, sh there needs to now only be one chair. And so when we click out of here and look at our family, um, you can see it's still putting two chairs in because we didn't want to break the array. So in order pres to preserve the array, we told it a value that now also doesn't look good. So now we have a conflicting problem, right? We, we solved the family from breaking, but now graphically it's wrong. Like we don't want this to show. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this is in this case um, where you have an array with the possibility of going down to one or zero, you've got to start getting creative <laughs> And there may be another way of doing this, but the only way I've really ever come by is we start to um, play with the visibility of the objects, right? So if you don't know this, you will now know this. If you click on a nested family or any geometry in, um, in Revit, each piece of geometry has this uh, over here, if you go into its properties, this visibility property. And so you can, sh you can decide whether something's visible or invisible when it's loaded into the project. So this is what we're going to start playing with. I'm going to come in here to my nested family in my group, my arrayed group. And I am just, I'm going to look at its visibility parameter and I'm going to uh, assign it a parameter now. So it's kind of like what we did earlier. There's this little box on the edge. You're going to click it. And it's going to give you a list of all the visibility parameters that are already in the family, which is none. So I don't want the user to touch this. So I'm just going to make up a name that makes sense to me as the programmer, because I, I would prefer that the user doesn't understand it, because I don't really want them messing with it. So um, I'm just going to do, um, let's do show chair. This is getting longer than I would normally do, but for the sake. Show chair multiple, right? Because it's multiple chairs and it's the visibility. I'm going to put it under other. So with my other parameters that I don't want people touching. Okay, so simple change, but now it's added it to our list of parameters. And now it's just a checkbox. So it's a yes, no parameter. It's either on or off. So by default, it's clicked on. I'm going to click it off just to show you what it does. And if we click OK, it doesn't look like it did anything. Because for some reason, in the Revit family environment, it doesn't show you the visibility parameter, or it didn't used to. <laughs> I think also in 2017 is when they gave us this little button down here at the bottom that says Preview Visibility. And we're going to turn that on. And all this does is allow you to look at the family the way it would be displayed in the project environment. So I'm going to turn that on. And now you can see the chairs disappeared on that side. OK. Um, and then this side, I'm just going to delete this array for now, um, because we're just going to, I don't want to do everything twice. <clears throat> OK, so the next level, if you're following along, now we need to have a single instance of the chair for this particular case when I'm going to turn the visibility on here for when the table gets short enough that only one, one um, chair should exist. So I'm just going to copy the chair here and we're going to go through the process of constraining it just like we did the other one. Okay. Well, not exactly like we did the other one. So this one, we're going to constrain its center to the center line of the table because we'll always want it centered. And then we're gonna constrain its back 
here. And there we go. So now we've got a chair that's constrained and we're gonna grab it and we're gonna give it a different visibility parameter. So if we go here, we're gonna associate a new parameter and we're just gonna do show chair single. So just a single chair on the one side. Okay, so now look how great our table's looking. Now there's one, one chair only and we can go in here and turn it on and off, okay? That probably isn't good enough for me if I was making this. Sure, we could allow the user to turn the chairs on and off depending on, but why not calculate it if you have the ability? <clears throat> so um, basically what we want to do is we need to tell the multiple visibility parameter when it should be on and when it should be off. And we need to tell the show chair the single chair when it should be on or off. So again, we're gonna have to do an if statement. So um, the multiple chairs is gonna be pretty similar to the number of chairs equation. So I'm just gonna grab that. Well, let's just start over to be clean. So we'll do an if statement. And this if statement is conditional on the same thing as the number of chairs, right? Basically, when you do the calculation based on the length of the table, if it's if it's great, if it's less than two, we need to shut it off. And if it's more than two, we need to we need to show them. So I'm as I was talking, I just realized I made a mistake. There's no if because the show. <laughs> The visibility parameter is a yes, no parameter. There's no such thing as an if statement. The if is implied, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is another thing that's hard to wrap your head around. When I was first doing this, I would get so confused by this. But basically, um, you just want to tell it the condition for it being on. Like, when should it be on? Um, so let's just say, when is it? When, it, when would it be on? When this equation up here that we were using as a test before when it's greater than two, greater than or equal to two. So we're going to take the test that we used before on the number of chairs, basically this whole equation being less than two, and we're just going to flip it. So instead of being less than two, it needs to be greater than two. And if we're being very accurate, it needs to be greater than or equal to two. So I'm just going to take this opportunity to tell you how in Revit you get an e a greater than or equal to. Are you shaking your head because this I'm is too much? I'm no, no, I'm shaking my head because I, I hate I hate the fact that there's no way to do greater than or equal to two. And every time it's I so try dumb. to teach this to a class, it's it's it it drives me nuts. Like <laughs> trying to explain the logic behind it uh -huh. because it is it is it's bonkers. <laughs> but go ahead, no, go ahead. <laughs> but it's good. You'll eventually need to do it, so you got to learn it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> my my process to keep myself from going through the roof, my brain from exploding out of my head, is I write it how I want it to be first. Mm -hmm. So we want this equation to be greater than or equal to two. So I just write it as if it's greater than two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to get the equal, all you're going to do is flip the sign and you're going to use a not statement so not this so what that looks like is you're going to do not and then a bracket and then i'm going to close the statement and then like i said i'm going to flip the um that little comparison symbol so now it what it says is this value this equation is not less than two, which is the same as saying greater than or equal to two, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to think about it, go ahead, take some time, pause, <laughs> if you're, and think about it. But I promise you, just, just flip the symbol and put a not um, function around it, and it, it's the same thing. Okay. So now you see that once we put that equation in, it unchecked the, 
the visibility. And that's what we wanted. So to check that, if we put in a value of eight, which puts three chairs at the table, it now knows, okay, now I got to show the multiple chairs. Okay. So let's put it back down to four feet, a four foot table. So we shut off multiple chairs and now we're going to write the equation for a single chair. <clears throat> and the single chair is just the opposite of, well, in this case, it's just the opposite of show multiple chairs. But I'm not going to write it that way because I'm going to do one more complicated thing after this. <clears throat> so uh, let's just write it as if the same way we wrote the last one. What needs to be true in order for this to show? And basically this equation up here that we were using before, that equation, oops, I forgot the bracket, needs to be less than two which is confusing because it looks like we just wrote the same thing that we wrote above, but it's not, it's the opposite. It's, it's the not. exact opposite. <laughs> can, you, can you scroll, uh, zoom into that part uh, to those two formulas for people? I don't know oh, if anyone can see yes. just, just to make sure. So um, awesome. So I think what we should do is, is we should pause on the knot and, and explain that tip one more time because that is a great, great tip. And, and I like the way you explained it, um, which is, um, um, you write it the way you want it to be, right? And then and then you put the knot and flip it. So so maybe <laughs> maybe maybe we should just do that one more time because um, okay. I do think it was awesome. So so okay. uh, so write it the way you want it to be and speak it, right? So so I mean this is this is a great tip. So so what you're trying and I'll, I'll maybe I'll speak it just because I think it's great to reiterate what you were saying. Um, so yeah. what you want it to be is you know this formula. You want this the result of this to be greater than or equal to two. But because we can't do an equal to, the way Revit handles it is you put the whole thing in brackets, right? You, you put not in the beginning and then you flip, you flip the, the, the sign. And then now you're saying greater than or equal to two still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not, for some reason, not is just one of those things that, that like the not, uh, uh, formula or syntax, I guess, is just one of those things that is is really hard to conceptualize or grasp. And so I think I think mm -hmm. the way you explained that was great. And I and what what I like about it is you don't necessarily need to understand the the, the context of the knot and, and just to, to know that that's the the rule essentially. Because <laughs> yeah. it is it is it's it's a challenging thing. I've had to teach this many times and figure yeah. different ways to do it. So I appreciate that. And I think a few people on the uh, on the chat did too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, you'll eventually have to, if you do this for very long, you have to eventually co confront it. But <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And there are, and there, there were people saying a couple of different ways they might approach it, like just putting a greater than one or, or something like that. And there are, there are a couple of different ways you could approach it. Sure. But I like this as a tip because I think it's a great way to, 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 to not understand, but just use the not syntax. <laughs> yeah. So cool, man. Awesome. Okay. So now ideally what happens is it's now showing a single chair and it's not showing multiple chairs because the table's too short. So if we put it back to eight feet, it goes to three chairs and look, it switched for us. It's now hidden the single chair and it's showing the multiple chairs. Perfect. It's what we want it to do. Have we made it break proof? We've made it a little more break proof. Getting the table can still get so small that no chair should go there. Um, there are other conditions I can think of um, that you might want to plan. I, I would have to plan for these. Mm -hmm. um, if it were me doing this, I would actually disconnect the length of the table from the user. And I would make another parameter that controlled the length of the table. And it just filtered so that if the end user ever put in a value below this set value, mm -hmm. it won't shrink the table any further than, than what yeah. I set. Right. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great tip. And that's, I call those input parameters and, 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 and that's a great tip. So if you, if you want and maybe, I mean, maybe we just quickly show one of those cause I do think it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, sure. it, maybe uh, add an input parameter and, and show the condition or something like that. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> this is something I will also know. <laughs> this, this is one of those errors that doesn't actually matter, but <laughs> I'll explain. It's telling me that there's two instances in the exact same place and it's true because we have an odd number of chairs, which means there's a chair exactly in the center of the table in the length. 
which is also exactly where our single chair is. So every time there's an odd number here, it's going to give me that error, but it, act, it does, makes no difference in the family and how it functions. So we're just going to click OK. Nothing that I've run into, but fingers crossed. <laughs> OK, so here we go. So let's look from our reference plane, our reference level. Um, this is the parameter in question. Well, let's let's for fun, let's do the width actually, because there is a certain width mm -hmm. at which the chairs along the length, they're gonna hit into each other. Like this side of chairs is gonna start hitting the other side of chairs maybe. Mm -hmm. So we could find out, let's just experiment what that width would be. Let's just put two and a half feet. Oh. My my screen real estate has dropped to nothing now between changing my resolutions <laughs> for the stream and then okay. Okay, so they're just approaching the middle of the table. So it looks like probably anything under two and a half feet is gonna cause problems. So if we hit two feet, you can see they've crossed the center line. Mm -hmm. So if they'd be doing this. So I don't I can you see me right now or is it yep. just my screen? Nope, they can see you. Okay. Yeah. You can, can see, see my you. hand gesture. Yep, yep okay. they can see you, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so basically we're going to control the width so that it never goes below two and a half feet. So we're going to leave the use. Uh, actually, let's let's put this back to three feet. So basically, what that does is we, in order to, for this to do the check parameter, is we got to we've got to disconnect the user parameter, which in this case we're calling length. We're going to disconnect that from the actual geometry in the family. So to do that, I'm just going to reassign it a new parameter. Um, so we're gonna go up here, create new parameter, and I'm gonna call this actual length. That's my naming convention for everything. It, anytime I have a control parameter, I put actual in front of it. So actual length, and then I'm gonna move this into the other category, because again, I don't want the user touching this. And we'll click okay. So now, I just disconnected the user from the family. And now I have this actual length parameter. So I'm just going to sort it a little bit because I want it down at the bottom here. <clears throat> and then I'll zoom in for us. OK, so what do we want this to do? We basically want this to be the same as what the user inputs almost all the time, except when it goes below two and a half feet. When they put in something less than two and a half feet, we don't want that to end up controlling the table. Uh, you, you did the length we were talking with. Oh, <laughs> dang it. OK, you're right. <laughs> That's all right. OK, OK, let's hurry, let's hurry and fix that. Uh, we're going to rehook up the length. And we'll just disconnect the width, so actual width. And other. We can probably leave that other one, because if it were me, I'm also going to control the length right, as right. well. I would eventually do that, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> OK. So let's open up our dialog back up. Right here. Okay. Okay. So let me zoom back in. Yeah, you're right. It's annoying that you have to keep Isn't zooming it? in. Here. And then, and oh, then it does that weird tab thing, and then you have to scroll. It's it's yeah, it's it's bonkers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dang so, it. Yeah. And if the formula. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I told you once you do it, that's it. You're done. So awesome. You, you close and reopen Revit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, okay. So. The actual width, like I said, will almost always be this. It, it's going to equal the, the the width parameter that the user puts in. So let's just start with that. So now we've tied the user input back to the family, right? Back to the geometry. But now we need an if statement to control that one instance or those you know those couple values that are going to break it. So we're just going to start an if statement again. So if, and then our test. So Basically, we're going to test if the width parameter that the user inputs, if that is less than two feet six inches, then what do we what do we want it to be? 
we'll, we'll just do the lowest it can go, which is two feet, six inches, two feet, six. Um, and then all the other times, what do we want it to be? Well, all the other times we just want it to be the width. So we leave it there like that. And if I did this right, oh, oops, okay. I just wasn't careful about the way I was entering the numbers. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, there we go. Oh, I still did something wrong here. It's got some crazy fraction, 2.5 feet. <laughs> Yes. Okay. All right. So let's break this down again. So if here's our test width is less than two, two or sorry, two foot six, then the value will just be two point or uh, two feet, six inches. All other times just pass through the user width that they put in. So let's test it. Uh, let's drop, let's drop down to one foot. So the user puts in one foot as the width, and this saves us, and it, it continues to be two and a half. Now, if they put in four, it will pass through the four. So it just isn't going to pass through the values that aren't acceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's all we did. So you just have to be careful with this. In my case, I prefer to do this, and the user will be confused when they realize that it didn't go to one foot. Mm -hmm. um, and you never know which is better for them, being confused that it didn't do what they asked <laughs> or, break or, <laughs> or breaking it. So uh, Revit doesn't allow us yet to give up, uh, pop up a dialog box that helps people right, understand right. what happened. So awesome. I just choose not to break the family. Yeah. It's, it's funny. There's a couple of people, uh, Ernesto was saying, it, it, it's funny to watch how, how you where you group your parameters versus where they do and stuff like that. And it sounds like do, a lot of people do use other as that area where they don't want people to touch. <laughs> Just yeah. kind of funny. It's, it's at the bottom of the list. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're running short on time. So I want to make sure that uh, you do, you do hit anything else that you wanted to tap on. This has been awesome. It actually turned oh, more yeah. into Revit, um, Revit family formula tips, which is pretty awesome. Kind of this <laughs> session. So maybe I'll change the title of it because it was, uh, but it's super informative. People people definitely enjoy it. So I do want to give you the opportunity to uh, to hit any any anything else. Maybe we didn't hit uh, we didn't hit tonight. Um. Oh man, I had so there's I could go all day on this family. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think we probably only got through two of the eight steps I came up with. So. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe we'll have a part three in uh, in, in the new year or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, this is great. This is great. So and, sick and, of me. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, this was great. And I, and I like the way you tied it back to the cabinet family and how, you know, just just showing how these things. Yeah, we're using a table and some chairs, but but the cabinet with the doors and and, um, you know, if, if you imagine a bookshelf or something like that, right, you can you can see how these things would apply to a lot of different family types. So yeah. super awesome. Hmm. I'll show you. I, there is one tip I can do really quickly that won't go crazy. Sure. Is um, something I got a ton of requests for. So I just came out with an update for my windows. Mm -hmm. And um, because before what I had is this set of windows and it turns out people like to group windows a lot like this. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a new line inside my window family where you could, the, group, the windows were already grouped, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of the feedback I got back, they were excited that now they, with one family, they could do their whole grouped window system. But what they were hating is they could only tag like all, like in this case, there's um, 10 windows here and they can only tag the whole thing as a group. And so it was really bugging everyone. And I didn't really think about that. So on the floor plan, they couldn't, cause I, I'll let you in my groups, you can change these. They don't all have to be the same window type. You mm -hmm. can have a slider, you can have, you know, a picture window, all that. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't make sense to tag it as a group. So something cool that you can do is when you nest a family, <clears throat> if you open the family before you nest it, so we're just open it up here. If you go up here to the family category, uh, category and parameters dialog box, if you come down in here, there is a setting that's called shared. And if you click on the shared and then reload it back in, in the project, it, it, so you reload it into your family and then load the family back into 
the project environment, what it allows you to do is you can tag the individual pieces of that family, the, the nested families. So I have an example of that. So on my windows, for example, you can, this bottom tag is tagging the group. So if you still wanted to tag a group of windows, you could, or you can now, you just, when you go to tag, let me just hit, hit the tag command. You can tab mm. select mm -hmm. into the nested families. And so now you can call out that one family or that nest family or the whole group. So that's a, that's something I learned recently. I mean, I've been doing this for how many years and I just learned about that to solve this problem for my users. That's awesome. That's a great tip. That's all. So when you're nesting families, check that box in the categories for share and it'll let you tag that separately from the group of nested families or mm -hmm. yeah, separate by, by tagging. That's awesome. That's an awesome tip. Great. Awesome, man. Well, Brenton, thank you again. We'll definitely have you back on. Um, maybe okay. we won't do it three weeks in a row. I actually do. Yeah. <laughs> we do have another guest next week, so I can't push. I can't push another guest. But uh, but we'll definitely have you back on. Uh, everyone seemed to enjoy this. I enjoyed it myself. Um, uh, I've learned something. And uh, yeah. Any any final last words? Uh, no. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Awesome. It's fun. Awesome, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight here live. Uh, it's been an active chat. Always a lot of fun. I will put links to uh, to information how you can reach out to Brenton, um, as well as the cheat sheets we talked about. I gotta fix mine. Apparently, it's. I just went on my website and like every single resource is now a broken link, which is. <laughs> So I'm, I'm having a little bit of a mini heart attack, but I'll fix all of that. And then we'll, we'll get that out. There's all of my free resources you can't get right now. I apologize. Actually, I shouldn't say that. The Twin Motion course you can currently download still, but anything older than that, all those links are broken. So I got to fix that. <laughs> but I'll put links to all of the family cheat sheets, all the syntax, all the good stuff. And uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Brenton, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, RevitFamily.biz is the website. Uh, so definitely go check it out there. And uh, with that, uh, again, guys, make sure you subscribe here on the channel. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you. Have a good weekend. Happy Veterans Day to the veterans. Uh, I'm, I know that may be just a USA thing, but that's what we do here. And uh, thank you to Enscape as well as Polycam for sponsoring the show. With that, I bid you all do. I'll see you next week.